and get started. Uh, welcome to the first uh, panel of this academic year by our research unit called SISMEC, remember that brand. Um, uh, just completing our first year of operation and we've already done uh, a number of events and publications and this will be the first uh, what we hope will be several this coming year. Um, our, our topic today and I'm going to mangle this because I don't have the actual brochure in front of me, uh, is anatomy of a tipping point. Something, something about the Arab fall. Okay, uh, Building off the notion of uh, the Arab Spring, the euphoria, the euphoria of the Arab Spring, which is now behind us, uh, of what now in hindsight look like uh, easy, quick, and satisfying narratives of revolution in Tunisia and in Egypt. And now we find ourselves entering the metaphor of the Arab fall, the longer, more drawn out, far more bloody, and far more uncertain uh, arenas, certainly of Libya, Syria, Yemen, and perhaps Bahrain, which we won't talk about very much today, but, uh, but, but we're certainly interested in addressing your questions as well. This panel, unlike some of the ones that we've done in the past, uh, is showcasing some of our graduate student talent, and I'm very proud uh, uh, to present uh, some of our top SISMEC research associates and assistants, um, and I'll just introduce them now with the topics that they're going to talk about very briefly. We'll have to cut them off after 10 minutes in order to leave time for discussion, which I will try and moderate at the end. Um, but we'll start out with Dylan Vaughn, uh, known to some of you as the instructor of uh, the Modern Middle East History course, uh, who is going to be talking about what we have characterized, actually, in, uh, uh, in one of our publications as the second wave of the Arab Spring and the characteristics of these countries that are currently now uh, in play. He is a PhD student in the School of Middle East and North African Studies, uh, working particularly on Lebanon. Okay? Next, we'll hear from Matt Flannis, uh, known to some of you as one of our Arabic instructors, um, who is an MA and MPA student uh, not only in the School of Middle East and North African Studies, but also in the School of Government and Public Policy, uh, who recently co-authored with me an article about international interventions in these uh, second wave of revolutions, and he'll be speaking about that today. Uh, third, we have Johan Chaco, another uh, School of Middle East and North African Studies uh, student and research associate uh, who's worked in the past as a military analyst, uh, who will give us something of the military uh, perspective and where things lie in the military balance of powers uh, on the ground. And Ahmed Meloud, known to some of you as one of our second year Arabic instructors and also now a PhD student in Islamic studies uh, in Middle East and North Africa, School of Middle East and North African Studies, uh, working on uh, Islamist movements, in North Africa, who will talk to us a little bit about the opposition movements on the ground. It's a wonderful lineup, and I love the audience that we've got here as well, a healthy combination uh, of aspiring undergraduates and community people, and I hope this reflects the future of where SISMEC is going to go. If you'll bear with me for 15 seconds more, I just want to point out that many of you who are here uh, from some of our larger lecture classes should know that we are planning to offer uh, a certificate in Middle East conflict studies, uh, for which some of our entry level 100 and 200 level classes uh, are the prerequisites, and we will be giving you more information as this program comes together, but you may well be able by the end of this year uh, to enroll in an 18 or 20 credit certificate program uh, that will give you a school certificate in Middle East conflict study if you've done this. We're also thinking about a five-year BA MA program uh, that some of you might well be interested in if this kind of thing interests and excites you and you've gone through some of the language and culture prerequisites. And finally, for the community members among you, I'm very interested in all of you who like the kind of work that we do uh, to please get in touch with me, whether you are a retired military, professional, educators, just interested community members. We are building up a database right now of our community base 
people who can help us, not just financially, uh, but also with your expertise as to how a very local, very humble, almost fund-free institution like we are uh, can begin to grow and participate even more in national uh, uh, and even international discourse. So I've talked too much. Without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Dylan Barr. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edson. Thanks everybody for coming today. Um, so my introduction is meant to lay out the conceptual fields of analysis that we're going to be dealing with in this panel. Sorry, I should move this a little closer. Revolving around what we at SysMech have been calling the Arab Spring Second Wave or the Arab Fall. Now, to understand the Arab Fall in the cases that we're talking about are Syria, Libya, and Yemen, we have to address the following question. Why have these conflicts been so much more protracted and violent than their early predecessors in the spring, namely Egypt and Tunisia. Now, this is the million dollar question which analysts and scholars in the field are going to be trying to wrap their heads around for years to come. And we at SysMech are very interested in this question and will address it in future panels, presentations, and our publications. Now, for this introduction, I'm going to forward three factors that I argue have made the Arab fall more protracted and violent. First deals with the loyalty of armies uh, that support regime survival and thus uh, continued conflict. Second, the presence of tribal and sectarian splits that can be exposed by regime heads. This can only make it more difficult to unify oppositions. Without homogenized oppositions, it's almost impossible to stymie the force of the regime and the violence it uses. Third is the geostrategic considerations of outside powers and how direct intervention, as in the case of Libya, or direct ambivalence, in the case of Syria, regarding regime abdication can only exacerbate the situations. Now, for the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on examples from Libya and Syria. We can talk about the similarities between Yemen in the question and answer section. Um, to explain high intensity conflict in Syria and Libya, we have to use a contrasting case that had similar conditions for conflict that not, did not lead to the same violent ends. So thus I'm going to use the case of Tunisia as a contrast to distinguish the similarities between Libya and Syria. Now, first dealing with the role of the army. In Tunisia, we have to understand that the army is largely professionalized and institutionalized. That is separate for the regime security apparatus that Ben Ali fostered um, and thus serves national goals more so than regime interests, which in the context of an uprising would be survival. Now, when the Tunisian armed forces decided not to condone the crackdown and then went a step further to assert themselves as the defender of the revolution, Ben Ali lost one of his major coercive tools. He thus stood on an ever shrinking island of support and it made it more difficult to conduct a widespread, con uh, widespread crackdown. Now this is very different from the army structures that we see in Libya and Syria. There are intrinsic patrimonial links between the regime and the army, whether vis-a-vis -vis sectarian alliances, as in the case of Syria, or tribal or familial alliances, as in the case of Libya. Now, my colleague Johan Chaka will talk about this more, but the most, Im most importantly regarding why these cases are so protracted is that with loyal officers and low-level defections, the regimes have the physical force to either continue a crackdown or an armed conflict. This only has the ability to make the conflicts more violent than their predecessors in the Arab uprisings. Now, second, dealing with tribal and sectarian splits. In the case of Tunisia, there are no major destabilizing sectarian or tribal splits. 98% of the population is Muslim Arab. Now, in trying to exploit the protests or the protesters, Ben Ali, the president, could call the protesters traitors or conspirators, but it was more difficult to call out an exact communal group for inciting the protests. Now, in Libya and Syria, we have to understand there are tribal and sectarian splits. Now, we don't want to overplay these or overemphasize them, but have to acknowledge their existence in the case of conflict intensification and conflict, um, and yes, intensification. Now, in Libya, the conflict is currently at a stalemate as we sit in Beni Wali and Sirte. 
And within the media, people mention that Sirte is a last stronghold because it's Qaddafi's hometown. This is not the only reason. Um, the Warfala tribe, which makes up one-sixth of the population in Libya, he still has, um, um, sorry, I got, um, he still has tribal loyalists in these towns within Sirte and Beni Walid, which are helping logistically in holding on to these last bastions. In Syria, it's more of a sectarian question. For example, many Christians, which make up 10% of the population, do not support regime crackdown, but do not want to see regime change exactly. They think that reform is possible under Bashar al-Assad. Now, the general consensus is that their minority rights are secured under an Alawi, secular, Assad-led regime. They fear that without Assad, a Sunni Muslim dominated government is possible, or even worse, a Salafi led government. Now, these claims might be preposterous, but this is the context of what we need to look in. In both cases, albeit to different degrees, large constituent holdouts only affect the homogenization of an opposition, and in turn affect its ability to force quick regime surrender, whether through armed conflict or civilian resistance. Now, third, dealing with the geostrategic considerations of outside powers. In Tunisia, geostrategic considerations of outside powers were generally low. Tunisia exports little gas or oil uh, reserves to the global economy and plays a fairly minute role in Arab-Israeli security issues. Um, thus, under the context of a cost-benefit analysis from external actors, after thousands of went to the street to call for Ben Ali's overthrow, outside powers saw little reason to defend him. It wasn't exactly in their interests. This only left him on a smaller island of support, as he was isolated both inside from the army, as I'd mentioned, and also politicians, and externally from external actors. Now, Regarding geostrategic considerations, this is not the case in Libya and Syria. While the dynamic is playing out differently in these two cases, the pronounced positions of outside powers only exacerbates these conflicts. In Libya, we have an interest-based intervention, which is dictated by the geostrategic interests of outside powers, Libyan oil. The two-way armed conflict, which we have to remember, started at a very low level before NATO campaigns, put in doubt the constant supply of oil from North Africa in this perspective of Western countries, predominantly European countries. Thus, when Qaddafi's coercive institutions decided on brutal repression, arguably the most intense in the early stages of an uprising, Western countries reasserted their position towards the regime, who they didn't really need for their natural resource-based interests. And then they forged a relationship with what they considered more respectable future partners, the Transitional National Council, the TNC, and Libyan rebels, and used NATO as a unified physical front um, to force regime surrender. Now in Syria, it's a different case. We have what I like to call interest-based ambivalence, dictated by the geostrategic considerations of outside powers dealing with regional security. Regarding the Arab-Israeli conflict and an Assad-led Syria in that arena. Now, a colliding faction of regional and international powerhouses, namely the United States, Israel, China, Russia, Turkey and Iran have perceived an Assad-led Syria better for regional security than the alternative, which at this point is uncertainty. Thus, no power has taken a strong position until very recently, um, within the summer months, which has allowed the crackdown to continue. And still in the last weeks, after rhetorical pressure earlier this summer from the United States, Turkey, and Russia, um, these countries have largely stepped back, and they're not really taking persistence and meaningful multilateral action regarding diplomatic issues. We're not talking about intervention here, but some sort of actual meaningful pressure. And what I argue in this sense is that Washington, Ankara, and Moscow, these three countries, have basically put this issue up on the shelf 
and are not exerting meaningful pressure. As we saw, we saw um, the Prime Minister of Turkey and Obama talk about putting more pressure on the Syrian regime, but no meaningful action has occurred yet. Um, and without meaningful pressure, the conflict can continue, can perpetuate. Now, these are the conceptual similarities that explain the more violent and protracted cases. Um, dealing with the role of the army, sectarian and tribal splits, and the role of geostrategic considerations in exacerbating a conflict. And they indicate the complex and multi-layered characteristics of the Arab fall. And my colleagues will now investigate these different fields of analysis at a deeper level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I will be speaking today briefly on the role of intervention in the Arab fall. So I want to begin with a research question, uh, which hopefully will steer some of the discussion later on, which is, has the quote, success of foreign intervention in Libya brought about a new paradigm for Western intervention in war? And if so, how will this be applied to the Arab fall, specifically uh, Syria? So I want to begin that with kind of a general description of the siege of Tripoli back in August and the role of NATO airstrikes there. So with a UN-sanctioned duty to protect civilians, NATO's no-fly zone had deprived Gaddafi of the air power needed to push, the rebel, push back the rebel uprising that had begun in February. Throughout the summer, British special forces had been seen in the western mountains and Nisrata coordinating NATO's bombardment with rebels. One week prior to the Battle of Tripoli in August, about August 20th or so, rebels had taken Zawiya, cutting off Tripoli from the strategically important road to Tunisia. Uh, the spark that set off the, fall of, uh, set off the fall of the Qaddafi regime, though, was a series of NATO attacks on, the, on a base in uh, the eastern edge of Zawiya, just as rebels were consolidating their control inside Tripoli itself. So, in the days preceding the fall of the capital city, rebel fighters converged from Zawiya in the west and Misrata in the east, with NATO clearing the way uh, with midday bombings. So, if we go back to this question of was NATO intervention key to the success of the rebellion, I would argue definitely so. Um, this is not to undermine the bravery of for sacrifice of uh, the rebels and the NTC, but to underscore the essential role of foreign intervention in modern revolutions. So, I think it's important um, before we go into that more to take, kind of take a step back and look at how we got there and compare the, uh, if we say, style of intervention of the Obama administration and compare that to the Bush administration. So uh, Bush's style could be said to um, revolve around the concept of preemption, which is basically uh, the idea of striking before being struck. We saw that in Iraq, obviously. And with an emphasis on unilateral action, so disregard for NATO and the UN initially. Also, um, the justifications for the Iraq and Afghan war were not uh, overtly based on humanitarian justifications, but more I see it as a projection of American power in the global order. Now, uh, the Obama administration, on the other hand, has, um, you could say, uh, returned to this Clintonian emphasis on multilateralism and a reliance on international institutions, and the emphasis and justification um, on humanitarian grounds. Some have called this burden sharing and alliance management, whereas others have critiqued this as, quote, leading from behind. Um, but I think it's important to distinguish between the political and economic uh, contexts of these policies and the ideologies behind them. So if you were to go back to 2005 and um, ask someone in the Bush administration if they would ever want to bail out all of the largest banks uh, in the United States, they would have given you a resounding no, but obviously that's going to change when the facts on the ground change and the economy looks like it's about to collapse. Uh, same thing with the Obama administration. He comes into office in 2008 with the U.S. mired in two world wars, um, or two wars, excuse me, uh, and of course, and uh, the remnants of the financial crisis of 2008, uh, basically leaving the, the U.S. not in a position uh, to unilaterally uh, enter a new foreign theater of war, and uh, this was only exacerbated by a large amount of domestic opposition to basically everything the president does, um, particularly from the Tea Party. So how does this apply to Libya? Is there a Libyan model, and is this a new way of war? Just to generally kind of go over the um, NATO operation in Libya, so with an attack on Benghazi by Qaddafi forces uh, seemingly imminent, U the UN passed Security Council Resolution 1973 on March the 17th, which called for, quote, the all necessary means to protect civilians. 
And interestingly enough, the no-fly zone was actually first um, proposed, the no-fly zone that came out of this resolution was first proposed by Nawaz Salah, Lebanon's ambassador to the UN. Um, and it's also important to note, uh, if we talk about going forward in terms of intervention, that China and Russia abstain from voting on this resolution. So NATO takes over on March the 24th, um, a few days after the first American strikes begin, and they implement a no-fly zone and an embargo. Uh, the majority of the airstrikes were carried out by the US, France, and the UK, with uh, the UK, France, and Italy um, putting special forces on the ground to assist the rebels. And it's also key, though, to note um, yeah, that there was a lot of non-Western and regional participation uh, in the operation. So Qatar, for example, provided fighter pilots, Jordan provided logistical support, the UAE sent in a dozen fighter jets, and Turkey approved the no-fly zone in its parliament, helped uh, enforce the arms embargo, and sent jets for aerial uh, operations. So uh, in the aftermath of this, we see international and regional players really trying to uh, assert their role in the future of Libya. Um, through visits by uh, President Sarkozy of France, Prime Minister Cameron of the UK, and Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey, all to Tripoli in the last week or so. Um, world powers are also moving to rebuild the Libyan oil sector, and the US and EU recently unlocked uh, frozen assets to the NTC. So uh, the question of, is this a new way of war? Uh, this was something that the Obama administration was really underlining um, after the fall of Gaddafi in August, um, saying that this was basically uh, a, a turning point, a, a better, uh, more effective approach to the uh, boots on the ground um, approach that was uh, highlighted during Iraq in the, the Bush years. Um, so uh, Ben Rhodes, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Communications, for example, of the uh, Obama administration said that, quote, the fact is that it is Libyans marching into Tripoli, um, and this not only provides a basis for legitimacy, um, but will also provide a contrast to the situations when foreign government is the occupier. So it's a very uh, non, uh, not very subtle poke at the Bush administration. But the emphasis here really, this new form, as they argue it, is on burden sharing and alliance management, as well as relying on indigenous forces. Uh, now I would argue though that this paradigm assumes that kind of the political stars can align every time for NATO, uh, the same way um, in future, potential future conflicts which really ignores the fact that NATO is so, uh, there's, there's so much disunity right now um, in NATO, particularly uh, with the fact that Germany did not even participate in the operations at all. And this paradigm also disregards the factors that made Libya a, quote, attractive option for military intervention, um, such as a relatively small potential for sectarian or religious conflict, the geographic, geographic considerations, and um, I would argue the fact that uh, Libya is less quote, strategically important, as in it's far away from Israel and is not uh, necessarily very close to Iran. So, um, the question therefore becomes, will this, this paradigm, uh, will this work in Syria as well? Um, now you've seen numerous tools of economic warfare against the Syrian regime being used, such as US sanctions against the Assad family, the foreign minister, Syriatel, uh, the major Syrian phone company, the Commercial Bank of Syria, and you've also seen EU sanctions recently passed, um, which will, in uh, November, bring about a full embargo of uh, oil imports to the EU. And this is important because the EU accounts for uh, approximately 95% of Syria's oil exports, and oil accounts for 30% of the Syrian economy. So that's not good enough for the Assad regime. Um, but the question is, will we see military intervention along with that? Um, while it's impossible to say conclusively, particularly since the prospect of protracted conflict in Syria seems only to be rising, um, I think there's no appetite for this whatsoever um, in the UN. Uh, Brazil, Russia, China, and India have all um, said that they oppose a UN resolution and UN action. Um, also, you had a recent visit from uh, a Russian delegation to Damascus this past Monday. Um, the U.S. and Europe also obviously have their own economic problems. Um, there's talk about whether the EU is even going to survive Greece, uh, Spain, and all these other countries that seem to be falling left and right. So firing million dollar missiles into a foreign country is not that appealing. Also, you have just the, the general demographic concerns in Syria. So Syria uh, was recently called by White House advisor the problem from hell. Um, it's divided unevenly between Sunni, Alawi, Shi'i, Druze, and Christian. Um, you also have a lot more, uh, or a lot different regional players at stake. 
uh, be it Iran or Israel, uh, which is probably also not that interested in intervention with um, a vote by the UN on Palestinian statehood, probably only a few days away. But if you agree with the Clausewitzian theory of war, as I do, that the continuation that war is the continuation of policy by other means, then an absence of military intervention may not be crucial, um, a crucial deciding factor when you consider what I just was pointing out about the, the economic measures, as well as numerous examples of serious continuing loss of regional allies, be it Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Bahrain pulling out their ambassadors, Turkey has now really stopped um, supporting the Assad regime. I think Turkey is really the one to look at as we go forward. Um, I was listening to uh, or watching Al Jazeera the other day, and an Afghan official was talking about how um, the only way that you will see peace in the future of Afghanistan would be a withdrawal of American troops and a peaceful mediation between the Afghan government and the Taliban by Turkey, because Turkey is, quote, a friend of the Afghan people. So you didn't really see that only maybe a few years ago. So I think it's really crucial to um, keep your eyes on what Turkey chooses to do, because I believe this will uh, set the tone for the rest of the international community. Thank you.